Right, let's cover creating a product design portfolio. When I graduated 18-ish years ago, internet portfolios were in their infancy and things were clearer. You send a company your CV with a cover letter and a teaser, which was a group of nice images of your designs. If they liked you, they invited you in for an interview and you showed them a paper-based version of your portfolio. These days, the whole process is more complicated. To interview, you can take a paper-based portfolio, a laptop, tablet, a memory stick. You can use a host of different presentation software or log onto the internet and go to a portfolio hosting site. What I see on these websites is sometimes a portfolio and CV mashup, sometimes only a teaser with a CV, sometimes a mixture of everything for prospecting. I think it's become a bit confusing, especially for a graduate. So before we get all internet, let's look at the portfolio I'd prepare for an interview. You'll see why in a bit. I know it's obvious, but the number one most important thing you can do for your portfolio is create brilliant work to go in it. There's a reason for putting so much effort into your projects. Good work stands out. Everything you then do in your portfolio is window dressing to show your work off in the best possible way. In a portfolio, you show what you've done, but it demonstrates to an employer what you could do for them, your potential. I see lots of portfolios put together from the designer's point of view, not the employer. I put this project first because it's my favorite, and I know it's a design position, but I do painting too. No. You need to show an employer what they need to see to make the decisions you want them to make. The great thing about job descriptions is that they tell you what skills the company is looking for, must have good sketching skills, experience of CAD packages. I use this to create a checklist and make sure my portfolio adequately covers all these things, or I can show similar alternatives and explain why I'm showing them instead. Whatever the job requirements, I use this list to arrange my portfolio, to emphasize these skills at interview, because these skills are what the interviewer is looking for me to show evidence of. So if good sketching skills is the main requirement, I'm going to make sure the first project I show absolutely nails this. Employers are not looking for you to demonstrate these skills in isolation. They are looking for you to show how you link them together, to show how you progressed, what decisions you made, what challenges you faced, and how you overcame them. So don't group all your sketching pages or CAD renderings from different projects together, because you rob yourself of being able to tell the story of each project. I try to organize my portfolio to answer all the elements of the job description in the first three projects. The other projects, as long as they're good, also confirm how suitable I am for the job. Have you ever heard the expression, you don't take a knife to a gunfight? If you're going for an interview at a company who designs cars, then the vast majority of your portfolio should be car design projects. If you're going for a job in a design consultancy who handle a wide variety of projects, then it's important that you too can show you can handle a breadth of projects. So do your research. Not only do you have to show projects related to the position, but within those projects, demonstrate you have the skills that they're looking for. When you prepare your portfolio, you typically start with your projects. But the first thing an interviewer sees is the outside of your portfolio, the carrying case, laptop bag, tablet case, or even the pen stick. So make it as professional as possible. If you've spent ages crafting a good portfolio, don't let it down by putting it in a poor presentation case. It would be like having food a Michelin-starred chef spent ages preparing served on a paper plate. One of the things an employer could be thinking is, can I put this person in front of a client? Are they professional? Everything has to look the part. The first image an interviewer sees is often a front cover. And personally, for interview, I keep this clean and simple. It's just a holding page. Lots of people show a page about them with bars on their skill sets. What does this tell the employer? I think I'm 8 out of 10 at Photoshop. What am I comparing this against? 
For years, I thought I was about an eight, until I saw a few videos from some other guys, and I realized I'm probably about a four. If you're going to include a skill sets page, I think it's far better to show how long you've been using these packages. This will tell the interviewer far more than a graph. But I could have been using Photoshop every day for the last two years, and all I've ever done is adjust the levels on photographs, hardly touching its functionality. So make sure you demonstrate your skills through your projects. Show the employer how well you can use each package. I often see young designers' portfolios that include a page that tells the interviewer what the design process is. Hey Product Tank, this is the design process. Yeah, thanks for that. In school for under 18s, it may be important to show you know the design process as part of the grading criteria, but I'm talking about an interview portfolio. You may feel you need to demonstrate that you know the design process, but show it through your design projects. The interviewer already knows the design process far better than you. Lots of portfolios have a summary page telling the interviewer what projects they're going to see. I don't include one. I think it spoils the surprise. It's like serving all the desserts before the starters. But also, your portfolio order and the projects you include should be tailored to each design job you're going for. Constantly changing the summary page is just an extra thing to do. In an interview, time is short. Imagine the interviewer is really starving. Don't tell them what they're going to be eating. Give them the food. So it's personal taste, but I don't include a summary page, a skill sets page, and never a page on what the design process is. For my interview portfolio, after the front page, I go straight to the projects. I'm going to prepare a personal project, a simple clothes peg I designed a long time ago for my portfolio. Your portfolio gives the edited highlights of each project, and each project needs to look coherent, so I need to create a consistent page style to give the project unity. For this demo, I've chosen a clean white page, a grey circle, and the font Arial MT for the body text, and that's it. There's no gradients or fancy stuff, it's just going to be about the work. I prepare my portfolio sheets at A3 print quality in Photoshop, because this is probably the largest they will ever need to be. And I save each sheet with A3 in the title, so it's easy to find. Then, if I ever have to submit my portfolio in a different size or format, prepare a PowerPoint presentation, or upload images to a website, it's easy to open this document, drag the images I've chosen and spent a lot of time adjusting into the new format, and reduce the scale whilst keeping the consistency and quality. Because as covered in episode 3, Reducing images keeps the quality, but scaling up reduces quality, so I always start as big as I will ever need to go. With the front cover, I choose not to show an image of the finished design, but I do want to set the scene, so I've chosen to show an image of what I'm redesigning. I tried a circle of pegs, but I don't feel it works as well as this peg pattern, but the circle image won't go to waste. I'm also including a title, and I've chosen a standard font that I think works, and tweaked it a little. It's important for every project to show and tell the interviewer what the brief was, so they can evaluate how well you responded to it. My neighbour Shirley suffers from arthritis, and challenged me to redesign the clothes peg. Fortunately, she's an amazing sport, and agreed to pose for a photo. I could show a close-up of just her face with the brief, but showing Shirley holding the peg helps set the scene so as a stronger storytelling image. It can be difficult to show research in a nice visual way, so I grab the headlines and try to represent my data in a meaningful way. Infographics work well. If you Google image infographics, you'll find plenty of inspiration. Again, to emphasize the story, I'm using familiar imagery and the grey dot. Anyone can put a load of sticky notes on a wall and take a photo. If you did this as part of your project, find a way of showing what those notes mean. Here, they don't help with the story, so I'm leaving this out. Lots of projects have similar starts, and it's good not to show the same process every time. I can show a brainstorming session I did in the same way in another project, if it was an important part of the journey. 
All evidence gathering, especially photography, should not be a last minute thought. If you set up and ran a focus group, or did an interview that gave you some fantastic insight that led to an idea and end product, show it. It's easy to concentrate on the job at hand and just take a record, but if you think ahead, you're also taking photos for later use. So I'm thinking about the type of images I need in my head before the event, the images that will best tell the story. If I ran a focus group and all I came away with was a collection of mugshots, no matter how I arranged them, the page does very little to tell the story. If I plan to capture a photo of everyone around a table discussing how to improve the product with examples of the product in the middle of the table and me in the thick of it, this will tell the story in a far better way. Plan and get good imagery at the time because it's difficult or impossible to get or make the imagery after. When I was working out what prototypes to make, I created lots of small sketches. Concept sketches are like maths exams. Examiners like to see your workings out. Sometimes portfolios can be too surgically clean. You don't find gold without digging through dirt. I'm working things out, so it isn't going to be perfect. I've arranged these little ideas on one page, which for interview on A3 or through a projector is okay. But if you're watching this on a tablet or phone, you can tell it's too small. So you have to test and make sure what you prepare works on the formats it's viewed on. Something to bear in mind for later. I didn't make a trend or mood board for my PEG project, and it's pointless creating one after, but if you created a trend or mood board at the start of your project, your design concepts and finished design better look as though they were influenced by the trends you identified. It doesn't matter how good looking your mood board is, if the finished design doesn't look like it was inspired by the images you collated, it rings big alarm bells. This is the same for every part of every project. When editing, you need to be ruthless because you don't want anything that distracts an employer in your portfolio. This is really important. Have you ever had a plate of food where all the elements were cooked perfectly, but there was one ingredient that you didn't like and it completely ruined the meal? Portfolios are the same for an interviewer. The likelihood is when going for a design position, one of your interviewers will be someone who is or has been a designer. What do designers do? They spend years training themselves to quickly identify problems, to find flaws to improve. So their eyes are more easily drawn to something that's not right than to something that is. It's a habit. You don't want an interviewer getting distracted by something that's wrong and missing all the good stuff. What you leave out is as important as what you include. This blue phone prototype drags the set down. Why was I trying to create a functional prototype in blue phone? It stands out for the wrong reasons. Having my prototypes in a line is a nice storytelling technique because it can show an obvious progression. But if I have a lot of prototypes in a row, it means the images will be small and harder for an interviewer to see if sat across a table. So I'm changing their arrangement to make them bigger. When I do this, I lose the progression, so I want to find a nice way of showing which prototypes I choose to take forward. There are lots of ways I can do this. I can make my preferred option slightly larger, I can grey the rest out, or I can give them a score. For the flow of the story, it's important that I can clearly show the decisions I made on each page and how I moved forward. So I make sure it's obvious what I took forward and then my next page reinforces this and shows how I progressed. This page proves I tested my prototypes and got feedback. I don't need to show images of every test. It's easy to get caught up trying to show how much you did on a project. If you sketched 50 concepts, it's natural to want to show how many ideas you can generate. But there's other ways to do this than make an interviewer sit through 50 concept sketches. A photo like this shows numerous concepts and then allows me to discuss this and on the next page show good sized images of the ones chosen to go forward. With the development sketches I've created for this project, 
I played around with layouts and ended up using the same layout as the prototypes page. Sometimes it's good to use the same format, but be careful, because if you do this too often, it can become boring for the viewer. Why do fast food restaurants show an image of a massive juicy burger with lettuce that looks so crisp people in the street will hear the crunch as you bite into it, and there's waterfalls of melted cheese oozing over a burger sandwiched between toasted buns that look as soft as pillows? You have to make all your images look as good as possible and represent the style you're going for while still telling the story. So choose the angles, the settings, the lighting. Are your prototypes best shown on a clean background to focus attention on the problem and solution or being used? Is the final model shown in an environment to best explain its use? Try taking photos with the product over to one side so that you can add text if you want to. Think it all through. I don't have a photography studio, so I'm photographing my products in my porch where there's a lot of lights and I'm using a reflector and a few cheap lights bought on Amazon and my camera's white balance to help because it's winter and the days are fairly dark. I damaged this model from another project just before I went to photograph it, which was really annoying, but I have Photoshop, so I'm going to get rid of the chip and adjust the contrast. I see lots of portfolios with photos of models with a fingerprint, a mark or a scratch that would benefit from a cleanup. But how far do you go? Because my PEG project was a personal project created without CAD and not put into production, no one was ever going to see the final model in person, only photographs, and spending days making a perfect model isn't an effective use of my time. In this case, it's about the design, not how good I am at model making. I've got better examples of my model making skills. If photography retouching or Photoshop skills are one of the things an interviewer wants to see, I'd use this project and add this extra page. I made a quick model, then used Photoshop to improve its look. This was the most appropriate use of the tools I had to give the best outcome for telling the story in the fastest time. In episode 3, I covered sketching big and putting one idea per page for presentations. So if you want to combine lots of sketches for a designly sketching sheet, you can do this in an editing package, but try not to make the images small and cluttered. Too many images, too many colours, horrible colour combinations will drag your portfolio down. This image is too cluttered, so if I had the opportunity, I'd retake the photos in a more neutral setting against a plain wall, but for now, the best I can do is cut them out or to grey out the background and leave the product in colour. Pages are quick to flick through, so you don't need to squash lots of images onto a page, just use another page. I haven't put much text on my pages because I'll be there, in the room, telling the interviewer what each part is, but if you are using text, Use simple clean fonts that don't distract from your work. For example, I never use Comic Sans. <laughs> There's a reason it's not called Professional Sans. For the final design, detail shots add interest, but if that's all you show, it's really annoying for an interviewer because they can't judge the final result. So always include at least one great image of the whole design. So here's the finished PEG project for my portfolio. I've put this up on Behance, which you can see here if you want a closer look. If you include a university group project, be clear that you can show exactly the parts you created, why you were given or volunteered to do those parts, and how well they help the group. If you've worked for a company as an intern or employee, but it's time to move on, and all the good stuff you've worked on is still confidential, Despite the fear of not having anything to show, never sneak this stuff out and put it in your portfolio without permission. You will seriously damage your chances of getting a job. Ask the company you worked for what they will allow you to show. If you thought ahead and took good photos of events, like a focus group, ask if they'll approve you using them. As long as they don't show any project detail, they might allow you to use them, but always get their permission. If all you can show is a page with the company logo and text showing you worked on four projects in the FMCG sector, your future employer will respect that confidentiality. Honesty and discretion are two very valuable traits.
Over time, this page can be expanded to show more companies you've worked for, areas you've worked and awards you've won. The experience of working in a company, the contacts you make and a good reference will carry you further than a few extra pages in your portfolio. OK, fast forward to the present. Unlike the in-person job interview portfolio, the internet portfolio has to catch the eye of the casual passerby. It's a presence that doesn't change as much because you're not tailoring it for a specific job spec, but showing the world a general version of your skills. There are loads of examples out there on hosting sites such as Behance, Coraflot and Issue, so have a search around for good examples. Now it's important to have an enticing thumbnail cover that catches the eye and encourages people to click into your portfolio, so it's worth experimenting. Once the portfolio is open, you can have a full-size front cover and an About You page can be important because you won't be by the viewer's side. About You pages can be tricky. You could write a few paragraphs explaining your life beside an image of yourself, but my preference is to tell a story through a photograph of objects. I like cooking, a glass of wine and blue cheese. I'm a sucker for a multi-tool. I like filming and I find painting relaxing. I'm currently listening to London Grammar when sketching. Whatever format, do it in a way that says a lot about you. It's personal taste, but mine doesn't have any bar graphs on my skills. Now, adding an overview page of your projects makes more sense because you don't have to change it all the time. And depending on your software, you can hotlink each image to take the viewer directly to the project that interests them. All the advice I've given about your interview portfolio layout and storytelling applies even more to your online portfolio because it has to communicate and tell the story of every project journey brilliantly without you being sat by the viewer's side, taking them through it. So where necessary, include brief descriptions and little notes on your sheets, but let the images do the bulk of the storytelling and drive the story to a good conclusion. For your online portfolio, a short video on a project can work well because it can communicate far more. At the end, don't just sign off with thanks for watching, include a call to action. If you want to see the rest of my portfolio or invite me for interview, please get in touch. Internet portfolio projects can be lots of pages. The viewer isn't time limited and we live in an age where people scroll rapidly through information. Length is still important, but more important is that your content is so catchy it makes people's fingers do this instead of this. I see a lot of student design portfolios that also show artwork. Lots of designers started off as artists, and you may be a great painter, but you're not going for a painting job. Some employers may like to see what else you can do, but there is also a danger that it can look like you haven't done much design work, so had to pad your portfolio out with your paintings. If you don't have enough design projects, create some personal projects, do more design sketches, make physical or CAD models. If you also want to pursue a fine art career, create a separate portfolio that shows your art on a hosting site for artists. Unless you're going for a multidisciplinary position, if you try and make your portfolio do a bit of everything, it could end up not working brilliantly for anything. Hopefully you can see that these days you need a different portfolio in different formats to maximize your potential. And you need to keep updating, changing the order of projects and including different project pages to make your portfolio as targeted as possible for whatever position you're going for. Good luck, thanks for watching. And if any of this was helpful, please give it the thumbs up.